All right. So welcome, everybody. We're here at Veterans Voice. This is Veterans Voice of America. I'm here with my co-host, Benjamin Krause, who, as you know, is a uh, disabled veteran and an attorney with Veterans Rights. How are you, Ben? How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing well. Thanks. <laughs> Good. I'm so glad. I, 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 it takes a minute for people to kind of see this and know that we're live. So we'll give them kind of a, a minute or two to come in. But I'm hoping that uh, the people that are coming and watching will know that they can comment, they can ask questions, anything during the show. And that way I can put them up on the screen and, and make sure that you see the comments. But please, everybody who's coming in, uh, make sure that you do comment, say hi to us, uh, ask questions, anything you want during the show. It's perfectly fine. We're hoping that you will. Jim uh, is saying hello from Georgia there, Ben. So I don't know hey, if you Jim. can see yeah, that. Can see <laughs> All right, perfect. So we'll just uh, keep everybody going there on the comments and we're coming in. So let's go ahead and get started while we're waiting uh, for more people. I, I want to know a little bit about, we, we talk a lot about David Chalk and the new, uh, the secretary of the VA. Now, I, I was very skeptical in the very beginning because I wasn't sure like, well, this guy had been there for a while. Uh, why isn't he doing anything under McDonald? Why, why wasn't he making an impact? So do you think Shulkin, what, what would you rate him now? What do you think? How's he doing? <clears throat> well, I mean, he looks like he's doing pretty well, uh, given that, uh, you know, to be honest with you, this process and the path was already set out pretty, uh, distinctly in large part underneath, uh, Eric Shinseki. Uh, starting in 2011. The the plan in the VA, while it does take different directions depending on who's there, it is largely already uh, set. And the uh, whoever, you know, is sitting in the deck chairs of the, the proverbial <laughs> Titanic, um, it really doesn't matter as much because, you know, it's going to be doing what it's doing anyway, you know, and they've been working towards privatizing the federal government well before even Clinton and uh, starting in large part under uh, Reagan. But then moving under Clinton, that's when a lot of the privatization occurred within the Department of Veterans Affairs. And they were working towards a lot of uh, public private partnerships with companies like IBM and, and some high level uh, consultants and outstripped the VA so that the VA itself became essentially dependent on the private sector to fulfill areas that require institutional knowledge that that are now gone so like a lot of its technology and a lot of its um uh similar similar skills that you don't think apply uh kind of like behind the scenes stuff so a lot of the things behind the scenes related to it and some other projects were were essentially outsourced uh, right now the clinics a lot of the clinics are outsourced so like the clinic management is uh, run by companies like sterling and a few others uh, throughout the country some of them are run by VA, but others aren't. And you may or may not be working with the contractor when you're going in there. So um, so this kind of goes back to your question about how Shulkin is doing now. Um, a lot of the privatization of the federal government, including the VA, started uh, you know, in large part under Clinton. And it would have continued under Hillary Clinton or Trump. It really didn't matter who was elected. Uh, they just may have uh, gone about some of the policies slightly differently. But uh, Shulkin is really just following the path and he, you know, is, is in there right now um, doing, you know, he, he, the, the decisions he is making now are interesting. Uh, some I don't agree with, some I do, but uh, I'm definitely glad to see them moving forward with the electronic health records, for example, uh, regarding replacing VISTA with a system that communicates between the Department of Defense and VA, which is something they've struggled to do for almost a decade. And it's so, trans so Ben, yeah. let me ask you, why, why did it take so long? It, it seems like it's very reasonable. Let's, you know, let's have that communication between the two systems so that if, if somebody's going in, let's say, and they want to have their medical records tied to anything else with their, the military record, it, it just seems like that, that was a, a sort of an obvious thing to do. Why are we waiting until now to have that done? Why did it well, take so long? <laughs> Well, a good question. I think now the uh, the forces are at play to move outside of a government-run system. So VISTA used to be government-run. The, the DOD, or it is still until they switch, DOD was, you know, obviously DOD-run too up until a while ago. They moved over to the commercial market. Uh, they had spent, in conjunction with VA, over a billion dollars trying to come up with a plan without any strategy. So literally they spent over a billion dollars coming up with a solution years ago, years. And, and 
wow. and nothing happened. And then they realized, oh, you know what? We're just going to go our own way. So so VA and DOD had a breakup. And and now uh, that Shulkin's in place, uh, they're going to get married. And so <laughs> you know, they, they suddenly not only announced, you know, that they were dating again. Apparently it was secret. And, and and instead they're together. So now they're together and, and the marriage will happen here over the course of the next three to six months, according to uh, Shulkin. Uh, they're not going to put it out to bid. Uh, they're just going to use the same company that uh, the companies that are that are facilitating that process now. And we'll just see. I mean, the let's see if I could find it. So I want to say the contractors. There was an interesting part, though, that I didn't write about recently that came up before. And I think it was the. Uh, the contractors with the, yeah, it's a $9 billion contract with DOD alone, 9 billion with a B Wow! like that's, that's incredible. But, uh, there was competition between, let's see, what was it? Uh, who got the contract? There was a, a bit of a rift anyway, between IBM and Epic and a few, oh yeah, here we go. Um, so uh, the the so the, the basically IBM got beat out, and so uh, the the competition was Epic, IBM, and Impact Advisors, and they were originally thought to be the favorites. They were beat out by Accenture, Cerner, and uh, Lidos to provide the contract. And so uh, over the course of ten years, it'll be X, but over eighteen years, which it can be extended to, it's a nine billion dollar contract that they were able to secure. Wow. And now VA is going to use the system too. So uh, DOD is rolling it out, VA. So this was back in, let's see, what was the date here? February of this year um, that they announced they were going to roll it out. And then um, now VA has said, well, we're going to do the same thing. We're not going to fight anymore because there was a, that rift with Vista that was created by the hard hats inside VA and was kind of this uh, kind of a scab system, it seemed like, where they would just put pieces together when they had time to work on the code. And it evolved over the course of, you know, 30 years, but it, you know, is, is unwieldy. It hasn't been maintained properly because the VA was gutted in the 90s. And so we have different parts of the system that are um, run by the fiefdom within which the VA exists in that location. So each VA location may pay for certain vendor services to fix it or not. And so some VA facilities have crappier records than others, as I understand it. So, uh, so it's just all over the place. And so they're just going to give it to MHS, fix it, uh, um, and and hopefully it works. So the, the VA, like the staff and the VA themselves, they're not going mm -hmm. to be touching the records and, and doing the inputting of the records, or is there anything like that? I mean, they're, they're just going to give it over to this company and say, here you go, you do it all. Yeah, that's kind of what it sounds like. So okay. they're, uh, the company's going to be doing the transition and then I'm not clear about how much that's going to cost, but um, you know, the, the Vista system right now, I get that a lot of the, you know, dorks out there that really enjoy code like it, but <laughs> um, it is uh, also really difficult to work with if you're not in the VA system and you can't look at it within a VA native computer. When they print it out, it's impossible. It's really hard to work with as an attorney. So when I'm representing veterans for malpractice against the VA or even going through disability compensation records or anything related to an injury, it's super difficult to, go through. And then when, if, I, if I have to hire like an expert, um, the, the records are redundant. So I could have maybe 100 pages of like genuine new records and 400 pages of like redundant information that you have to parse through to find what really matters for the case. So it's really unwieldy and uh, disorganized. So hopefully uh, with the new system, it'll be um, easier to sift through and it'll help me, you know, soothe the VA better. <laughs> well, I'm sure that they're probably doing that just for you too. And they're so happy about that. <laughs> yeah, but they're thrilled. Now, are, are there going to be any problems with HIPAA violations or anybody that's, you know, unauthorized kind of going in one system and getting in the other medical records type thing? Well, I mean, they've been doing that anyway. So okay. there, you know, I think VA is, is one of the worst offenders, as I understand it, uh, regarding HIPAA and some of these other laws, you know, and, and, while they are very big, they do have uh, employees who like to get after veterans and, you know, read through our records if they're mad at us to see if they could, you know, whatever is a form of harassment, really. And um, right. I think that'll continue. I mean, until we see more accountability in the VA and people actually get fired and then 
prosecuted for the crimes right. that they commit, you know, because again, it's one thing to fire, but hey, these guys should go to jail. So let's put them in jail and send the right message to these federal employees that, you know, if you're going to do it as a you know government employee and not go to jail, but if you do the same thing as a private citizen and go to jail, like that's a definite you know, double standard. And just because you work for the Fed and Uncle Sam doesn't mean you should be above the law too. So hopefully under Trump, we're going to see some prosecutions of some of these uh, amoral idiots that are in the VA. There are quite a few. There are a <laughs> that lot would of be a change. Employees. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of great employees. But, you know, let's be honest here. There haven't been a great deal of uh, prosecutions of any kind, except against kind of the piddly ant uh, criminality stuff where they go after the little guy. But when it comes to the folks that are really benefiting and profiteering off of fraud or, or complicit relationships with government contractors, I mean, nothing happens. Totally above the law. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit. Jim had a question, and this will kind of segue into what you're doing. Uh, he wanted yeah. to know if he could use his voc rehab more than once. He said, I'm, I'm trying to be self-employed. I use it. I used it already to get certified in my field. And I guess that is that your book that he's talking about or is that? Uh, yeah. So he's talking about my book that I sell on disabledveterans.org. Uh, it funds uh, my entire operation regarding my work as a journalist and my investigations into the Department of Veterans Affairs. So uh, whoever you know contributes to that is, is helping me hold VA accountable. So I, I appreciate your support. So as far as Jim uh, and his question, uh, I'll use me as an example. I used Voc Rehab a few times. And so Voc Rehab paid for my undergrad at Northwestern University. They paid for my law school uh, three years later, uh, where I graduated from, um, uh, graduated from the University of Minnesota Law School. And then after that, after I became an attorney, they also funded uh, the cost of a lot of my startup equipment. So wow. all in, the Voc Rehab paid uh, around $350,000. Uh, for me to go to school and become a lawyer and to sue the VA, you know? So, I mean, they usually say, don't bite the hand that feeds you, but you know, I guess. <laughs> but in this case, it's worth it. It's what I do. It's what I'm good at, you know? Um, so, <laughs> you know, it just is what it is. Um, but I love those guys. I mean, the, the, you know, folks like to think that I, um, you know, hate all VA employees or whatever, but I, but I really don't. Uh, you know, they, they just invited me to go talk with a bunch of the VRE officers at St. Paul next week during a veteran panel. So uh, we're going to be able to talk with uh, the VRE officers about our experience. And those are basically the bosses of each regional office as it relates to voc rehab. So they're responsible for, you know, hundreds of millions in training at each location, you know, or something wow. like that. Uh, maybe not hundreds of millions, but definitely in, in the tens of millions, I would assume. So, uh, you know, these folks are responsible for a lot and, and they do a lot and they put up with a lot. I mean, you've got to be honest that, you know, some of us veterans are not easy to get along with. But uh, um, but as far as Jim's question, you know, the, the time limit, Jim, is is really flexible depending on a thousand different factors. So, you know, your disability rating, your... Uh, whether you have an employment handicap after you were certified, things like that. Um, so when it comes to starting a, a small business, there are a bunch of different ways to go about that. Um, and, and you could at least apply and just see what happens. I mean, you really don't know. And this is, I get this question a lot, you know, from veterans where they're like, well, Hey, here's my situation. Um, uh, what happens when? And it's like, hey, man, you don't know until you apply <laughs> because yeah. the VA has such variability in that program um, that counselors, it's really up to the discretion of the counselor in many ways. Um, hopefully they get it right. I, I represent veterans when, when voc rehab gets it wrong um, and they keep me in business because they get it wrong frequently. So uh, yay for me, I guess. But, you know, I, I, I work with them on a regular basis to try to improve their their program and help them. Um, uh, move the ball forward so that they can, you know, hopefully help veterans uh, get the training that's appropriate for them and, and uh, you know, start the businesses that are good for them without having the need to turn to an attorney to fix it, you know. So that's one of the things I do quite a bit behind the scenes and why they're inviting me to go talk to the VRE officers next week. We have a, we have another book. Uh, James is saying thank you to your, the advice from the, the Voc Rehab book. And he'll uh, be entering Masters of Social Work in August due to it. And as a question... Cool. He says, I want to get my PhD in a few years after I finish my MSW. I'm currently rated 100% scheduler, 
going to apply for P&T soon. How do I go about utilizing the rest of my GI Bill? Only used about 10 to 12 of the, let me just scroll down, of the 36 on post 9-11 after using two to two and a half years of voc rehab. Thanks and keep up the great work. All right. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And uh, <laughs> again, love the support. Um, you know, it helps me hold VA accountable but, and also to, you know, improve the system quite a bit. So, um, okay. So I'm seeing the different messages uh, from Jim coming up. So to that other question, um, let's see here. So the question is about GI Bill usage and, you know, I want to go get a PhD later. So there are a thousand different ways to skin a cat and um, that cat is your education. So even if you can't get VA to pay for it, there are many different scholarships and opportunities to get your PhD for free right from the university. If you do well in your GRE mm -hmm. and you go to a competitive school uh, like Northwestern where I went or, or uh, even the University of Minnesota, um, you know, Chicago, Yale, you know, a lot of different schools that are competitive in the field will many times, you know, have you go there for free if you're competitive. So that's something to keep in mind no matter what. And if you can do that, great. Then you don't have to worry about voc rehab or GI Bill or any of that. Uh, now, your every veteran is limited to 48 months unless they have a serious employment handicap at that time. So um, there's, again, a lot of variables there. This is my niche. I'm one of the only attorneys that practices in this area as far as I know. Um, but each case is different, I guess, is what I'm trying to drill down into. And I'm not able to give, you know, a lot of particular feedback because, you know, I could write a, a book about each case because they're so nuanced and the different possibilities that a counselor might take. So with your, your, my guess would be though, in this context, um, after getting the master in social work, um, odds are you'll, you will have depleted your entitlement to education benefits. If you move over the 48 month window, if you don't have a serious employment handicap, and I doubt that you would at that point because your master's degree, uh, it would be hard for you to get above 48 months. Um, so in that context, odds are you will have depleted both GI Bill and folk rehab because you'll hit that 48 month window and you'll have the master's degree and probably not have an employment handicap at that point. So that's, that's my two cents on that question. And then somebody else is asking, can you practice in Georgia? Yeah. So, um, I can't practice before the court in Georgia. So in other words, I'm not a Georgia attorney. I'm not licensed there. Uh, luckily, Voc Rehab is a federal practice, and I can represent veterans for their veterans' benefits anywhere in the country uh, because I'm an accredited uh, attorney with the Department of Veterans Affairs, and I have education in that. Um, so hopefully you know, that gives you uh, enough feedback to, to know what I can do. But uh, I can and will represent veterans if they have uh, the type of case that I uh, like to work on. Um, in, in Georgia, if that mattered. And then you would have to get funding from the client or do you get a funding from other service sources? So it, I mean, as a private attorney, so I, I have a pro bono practice and there's certain veterans that I'll represent there. Mm -hmm. Aside from that, I uh, work contingent fee for disability compensation cases and malpractice cases where if I win, I get paid. Uh, and if I don't win, I don't get paid. And then for voc rehab and other programs where I'm helping veterans after they've been, you know, denied, of course, uh, that's the only point that I'll, I'll represent folks and benefits is after they've been denied. But, um, once they've been denied and, and we file the appropriate paperwork, um, for voc rehab, if I'm helping you get approved for like a law school or medical school or whatever, I do charge uh, an hourly fee or a flat fee, depending on the circumstance and represent the veteran uh, in that capacity. So there the veteran pays me directly. Um, in the other, the, uh, you know, the contingent fee, the veteran does pay, but, um, but it's only after the claim is resolved. Okay. Good to know uh, that way. Cause a lot of times I think people think that you, maybe you're working for free or they don't have a charge and it's good to know that, you know, kind of the different services you provide and what is oh, yeah. paid for, what isn't. Well, I have children in a house. I have to pay yeah. for those things. So, <laughs> just like any other American, I, I, I cannot work for free. And yeah. since we live in a capitalist society, I'm more than happy to accept payments for being, you know, great at what I do. So. Exactly. Um, now I want to talk a little bit about the OIP, uh, opioid uh, addiction that we're that we're hearing a lot about. Can you yeah. talk about what happened in Missouri and in, in, in the VA in Missouri in regards to the opioid opioid 
addiction. I can't even say it today. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of just a funny word, you know? It like, is, op- it is. Opio, opio, you know, it took me a while to figure out how to, um, how to get talk about that. Yeah, yeah. cuz it's like is it opiates is it opiates <laughs> like what, what you know what's the, what's the appropriate way to you know talk about this so I so I wrote about the thing in Missouri I just pulled it up here it looks like we got you know 350 comments although a lot of those are from my a lot of my readers will post just articles that they're researching whether right. it's on point or not and then have a discussion about politics so uh so I, I love my readers like they're awesome they'll come come out <laughs> like with all kinds of awesome stuff you know so so it's a pretty busy um community on my website. But um, so so with respect to, to this one, they uh, basically found that uh, they concluded that at this particular facility in Missouri, which is the, the John J. Persing VA Medical Center uh, located in Poplar Bluff, Missouri, that um, at least one medical provider there, one clinician, they didn't, I don't recall if they specified whether it was a uh, doctor or not. I have a hunch that it wasn't. It was probably somebody working under the license of a doctor who was, it said primary care provider, uh, but I I suspect it was a nurse practitioner, somebody operating, you know, kind of in the gray area of what nurses should really be doing. So uh, anyway, that's what I'm guessing. But this person Mm -hmm. lacked, as the quote is, we found that a provider lacked knowledge of safe and effective methods for tapering patients off opiates uh, or tapering patients opiates. So basically, uh, there were patients, multiple, who were not being tapered properly by this provider. And there were a lot of other problems too there. But um, this provider just had no knowledge of how to do it right and was uh, apparently removing veterans uh, unsafely, because this is what's implied here, uh, from opiates, right? So they were basically just cutting them off. And this goes back to the 2013 scandal that started in Toma uh, up in Wisconsin uh, in Candyland with, you know, Candyman up there, David Houlihan. Uh, a, a former VA psychiatrist who was fired as a result of uh, the issues there, um, where he was uh, uh, rumored, and this is again rumored, to be conducting experiments on veterans without having an IRB. So supposedly, uh, according to some of the folks working there, and this is unconfirmed, he was engaging in uh, you know illegal practices of experimentation on vets by giving them opiate uh, cocktails and and drug cocktails. <laughs> to zombify them. So a lot of times <sighs> dealt with veterans that had PTSD and he was working on, you know, essentially a zombification cocktail for these, you know, supposed dangerous veterans with PTSD. Um, and, and he got busted. A lot of people there got busted. Um, uh, it was investigated by DEA. They didn't come out with any particular findings. The state of Wisconsin also kind of, I think, brushed it under the rug at some point, but, uh, but he was, he had to leave the agency and, um, a few veterans were noted to have died as a result of the practice. Um, it, so th- basically that happened in 2013, immediately after the scandal uh, broke internally, but before the public really knew about it, VA then implemented a opiate reduction program that uh, removed veterans off of opiates very quickly that resulted in a great deal of harm for veterans that were injured. And, and part of the problem that they were running into is that the, the VA was using some theories from civilian medical providers, and that's how it was being analyzed. But civilian uh, individuals are not exposed to the same type of harms and injuries that uh, military members are who get blown up in IED blasts and stuff like that, who do have maybe more uh, issues related to pain than civilians. And so they were using the same metrics and they weren't lining up properly. So it would be akin to, for example, uh, using the MMPI-2 uh, which is a personality test, and not running the PTSD scale because uh, veterans with PTSD will flag as being liars or malingering when in reality they have PTSD and they're paranoid and they're anxious. And that's a wow. real diagnosis. And if they do that, you know, then, then they can be flagged as liars. So similarly, you know, s- veterans related to pain are having different responses than civilians because what caused the pain is probably more likely due to a blast in most civilians aren't exposed to IEDs in the Middle East. So uh, it's, it's a different uh, nuance. So, so how could these, you know, the, these practitioners or the doctors, whoever it is, don't they have training and to know how to, to taper people off of these medications? You know, why, 
how can they just say, well, you know, we're just doing this. We don't even know what we're doing. We're hit and miss. Who's teaching these people? Where, where are they getting their training? Shouldn't they have been taught this? You know, how, how do they get, how does this happen? Well, and they're supposed to be um, training these folks. And in this instance, the person just wasn't, wasn't trained. Uh, there's no, ex I don't have any other explanation for it. Uh, it sounds like the VA's system for tracking training is maybe not as uh, efficient and effective as it should be. That's the only thing I can think of. And it's not just with this. Like we have, uh, you know, instances where veterans will come to me with a family member, for example, who had a stroke at a VA and, and the doctor or the nurse practitioner, or whoever was involved in the, in the pre-stroke care uh, wasn't trained hadn't been trained in years. And in fact, the standard of care for stroke in one instance in Toma, as another example, uh, uh, in that instance, the, the practitioner hadn't been trained in stroke since 2011. And the standard of care for stroke prevention had changed dramatically between then and 2014 when, when the uh, death occurred. So um, the, the, just the VA is very slow on adjusting its training related to some very catastrophic issues like stroke prevention, probably cancer, um, uh, a number of other heart attack. You know, anytime you see a standard of care change, the VA is, is substantially slower to adjust to it than anyone else. Like any private, you know, facility would never get away with that kind of stuff. But like another example would be, um, you know, heart attack care and atrial fibrillation, which changed um, in 2014. And the standard of care, you know, didn't change a ton, but it really embodied kind of like with the Bible, how the Bible existed in a bunch of different books. And it was right. all kind of the Bible. And then they decided in, you know, 300 AD to put it all together into what we have today. Uh, similarly, you have different kind of in that metaphor, different books, like different articles or, or, or ideas or thoughts or practices that occur in the medical community that are then written about through peer reviewed journals. And then after a while, they recodify what the standard is in a singular document. So when that occurs, the VA just lags. So I had a doctor recently tell me that uh, in writing uh, um, related to a denial of, of a client, um, you know, mentioned that the uh, standard of care for stroke uh, prevention um, isn't uh, settled yet. It's not settled, you know, and this is 2017. This standard changed and was codified in 2014. There should be no question about what to do, <laughs> what type of anticoagulants to use to protect against stroke. And they're like, oh, there's no standard. Oh yeah, there is. But you know, mm -hmm. you're the VA and y'all don't have standards. You just, you know, practice medicine like you're a bunch of uh, barbaric buffoons, you know, that seems mm -hmm. to be what at least the cases that I get again, I only see the ones where right you, know, you see they, the worst ones <laughs> chopped up the veteran or something. But um, <sighs> you know that's what I see. So uh, you know when I see it again in a, you know uh, you know under penalty of perjury, this person submits this information. It's like what, <laughs> what were you reading? <laughs> like, that's <laughs> not not true at all. But you know that's again there's no accountability, so they just say whatever. I um I don't know if we can see this up on the screen, but James has provided a link there if anybody wants to know uh, how the VA is supposed to do the the tapering. <laughs> you oh, know, sure, and, yeah. and the thing that that is so bad too, because some of these people you know had to have gone and and looking for other things to help them. You know, when they they weren't being tapered properly, you right. know, like let's say heroin or uh, you know other drugs to help them. How many sure. how many people Black died from that? Yeah. Well, and, and we don't know, but uh, we do know that it was going on and the veterans were seeking out heroin and, and other f ways to deal with the, the pain. And meanwhile, VA was using their research on how to get veterans off the juice um, for their own publications and studies and their own purposes. So, you know, they create this whole, you know, painkiller reduction plan. And then these new doctors, hey, look, we're revolutionizing the system. And it's like, well, no, you're experimenting on veterans because it's not yeah. settled yet. Like what you're dealing with hasn't been resolved and has, it's not an established uh, system or, or 
style of practice at the moment and you're just tweaking it to see what happens. And it's like, that's, that's unacceptable to experiment on vets, but you know, that's just me. So. Well, and, and, and do they do this because they know that uh, in with the government, you have to ask permission to sue the government so that they think that people aren't just going to go out there and sue them, that a lot of people will be discouraged because they have to go through this long drawn out process. Is this why we keep having these well, ab yeah. alleged abuses? Absolutely. And you don't sue the doctor. The doctor is not personally responsible right. like they might be. I mean, they need to be. That needs to be they the need change to be. In the law where yeah. they do have to pay a certain portion of the mal, you know, damage from malpractice. But uh, right now they're insulated. And so when you go to sue, it's the Department of Justice versus you. Just a little mm -hmm. old veteran, you know, and, and uh, unfortunately that's um, uh, what was it here? Did I just see? No. OK, sorry. I just thought I had an announcement from somebody. <laughs> uh, about who the new uh, veteran benefit administrator is going to be, but I, uh, that was mistaken. We're not quite there yet. Not quite so, there. No, it was, it was rumored to be coming out very soon. Um, and I'm waiting for my contacts to let me know before anyone else knows you know, who's going to be the new head <laughs> of the benefits agency. So we'll just see what happens. We're, we're, we got our fingers crossed on one candidate, but uh, I'm not sure how it's going to go. Um, so anyway, that's that's the, the long and short. And then in addition to that, as if that's not bad enough, then come to find out VA drug theft is the problem. Uh, and, and people are stealing drugs intended for veterans. And it's not, not the veterans. It's the VA doctors, nurses, and pharmacists that are engaged in skimming of drugs. And then probably they're using them themselves, giving them to friends, or putting them on the black market. We had one case where a guy, the head of uh, the Puerto Rico VA down in San Juan, was caught apparently drunk in a car um, with opiates or some kind of painkiller that weren't prescribed to him in his pocket that, you know, at least uh, on the surface looked like he took from, you know, the facility he was in charge of. Um, he was fired the first day Trump was inaugurated and then rehired back into the VA after he filed an appeal. So that's, uh, uh, what was that goofball's name? Hamlin. Was it Hamlin? Yeah. yeah, it, yeah. Is, so do we know what happened to him? It, is he, he's, we don't we don't fully know uh, i'm still waiting to find out exactly you know what his job is and how he was able to get back you know into into the va you know he's getting a paycheck he's there and the guy was like probably the most corrupt employee that i had ever heard of like the stuff that he did wow. at least that came out i'm sure there are other corrupt uh, leaders within the agency that um you know benefit their friends and you know could care less about veterans. I'm sure that goes on. But in this context, like the stuff this dude was like uh, pinged for was just incredible. Like just the guy was, you know, it was, he was special. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> but what special. happens, what happens to these doctors and nurses? I mean, because if this were a private hospital and you're taking drugs and you're, you're found, you know, I mean, there's a system to know who's taking things and who's writing the prescriptions and how much and to whom, and, and people are overseeing this. Is there, is there no oversight in the VA for this type of thing that once you're caught, I mean, I, I know you can be transferred, but you right. know, isn't there something that pr can prevent this? Well, you know, you would like to think so, but, yeah. um, you know, it's an interesting thing with, with, um, with this guy. So, so D Wayne Hamlin. So he, uh, it's not just that he ran San Juan. I mean, this guy was teaching other VA executives at a leadership convention last September, you know, so this guy's an educator of leadership, right? And meanwhile, he's, uh, harassing and attacking whistleblowers. He's basically engaging in open fraud to try to pay them off uh, so that they would in turn make fraudulent claims against other whistleblowers and then wow. hiring pedophile, like what was one, the one guy was a, a convicted sex criminal to um, run human resources. And then another person who he put into contracting there had also been convicted of, of credit card fraud. Then there was another case of a woman who uh, engaged in, in robbery, theft, I think with a gun, didn't get fired from his facility. So you're just kind of like, what is going on? I mean, it's like a modern, and I keep saying this with the VA, it is like Lord of the Flies at some of these places. And it, it, it just kind of look at it like, how in the hell? No wonder things don't work right. No wonder it costs so much. Like you got these lunatics running, running the farm. I mean, the loonies are in charge of uh, the animal farm. Like it's... Is bizarre, but that's that's what we have 
right now at some locations. I mean, there's there are some great leaders in the VA, no question about it. There are great leaders in our federal government, you know, and I hope that they rise to the top if they're not already there. But um, there are also some hooligans. And um, I, I have no idea why it's so difficult to fire them. But, um, but it is. And, uh, you know. Is it due to a shortage? I mean, it, I mean, every time I, I see an article, it says, well, you know, we have a shortage here. We should have had this and, and we don't have enough doctors. We don't have enough staff. I mean, are they afraid to get rid of people because they think that we're so short staffed now we have to limp along with the no. people that we have? I mean, this problem's been there for ever since the VA was VA, you know, like yeah. it has been a corrupt agency from day one. And I think the, the founder of it, um, as I recall, uh, one of the founders of the present Veterans Administration had also been pinched in, in a fraud scheme. So they just they just do it. They engage in fraud. It's just uh, it's what they are. You know, it's it's just one of those things. So um, so hopefully that'll change, though, you know, at some point. But until we dig some of those folks out of there and out of that system, you know, that we're, we're always going to be stuck with this kind of problem, you know, until people go to jail. You know, like this one dude who had, you know, drugs in his possession, drunk in a car, uh, all these other things like like engaging in open fraud. Like, why is that not a RICO violation? Why is he yeah. not in jail? Why is the Department of Justice not prosecuting him? You know, that should be happening because he engaged in fraudulent activities to harass people using money of the federal government to get it done. You know, the guy is a crook. And he should be in jail. So why? Why Trump? Why is he not in jail yet? <laughs> you know? well, I mean, seriously, like, hey, you know, we got the tough guys supposedly in office right now. What's what's going on with this dude? Uh, why is he not being prosecuted? Like, well, he is. On? He's been a little bit busy with uh, all these uh, false accusations. So hopefully, you know, when when now that that's cleared up by Comey uh, indicting himself yesterday, maybe yeah. we can move forward. So you well, know, well, hopefully, he needs to take a couple of these guys by the short and curlies, make an example of them, and then boom, done. You yeah. know, and in fact, that would help with the false allegation crap because then at least. Uh, yeah, you know, it, it, he'd be showing like, ah, oh, you know, whatever, that's garbage. But look what I just did over here. I just whooped this guy's ass. I mean, yeah. but, I mean, but I said, <laughs> 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 now I, I wanted to ask you too. you know, do you think the VA is finally starting at all, you know, to really listen to what veterans have to say? Or are we just kind of, you know, running this little show again where we're not really listening to veterans, but we're we're pretending at the VA that we are? So that's a great question. And I'm thinking that they, well, I know that they listen to me because I see the policies change after I talk to them about it and uh, confront them with, with documents, you know, uh, about it. And the, the obvious, you know, um, paddle that I carry is my website, disabledveterans.org and, and the possibility that I work with massive and fantastic, um, reporters across the nation, including my, my good friend here in Minneapolis, AJ Legault, like he and I are coming out with a new thing next week about, um, about non VA care and VA uh, erroneous denials of emergency room, uh, healthcare and, and coverage for veterans is supposed to be covered. It's a three some odd billion dollar a year issue that VA is uh, now being caught engaging in practices that were putting veterans at a serious economic disadvantage by wrongly denying emergency room bills, um, saying that the veteran is not a, you didn't behave like a prudent layperson when you went into the emergency room and you thought you were having a heart attack and you would have just been what sitting there having a beer. Like what's the other alternative, you know? Um, so we're, we're going to be hitting that one um, soon. It's going to be coming out. And, uh, you know, so your question was, is VA listening? I know they're listening to me. Does that mean they're listening to average veterans? I'm not sure. Uh, probably not. Uh, but this is the most egregious that I know I can accomplish, you know, some kind of good move the ball forward uh, for the greater good of veterans. Um, you know, I push it forward through the press and through my own website and, uh, and they're listening to that. So I guess, you know, de facto, they're listening to veterans, right? Uh, I am a disabled veteran and uh, the stories that I bring to them from my clients and from my readers, uh, they do take action sometimes. Is that, was that the, the way it was under the Obama administration and it's changed under the Trump administration or what, what caused that difference? Um, so under, under Obama, things got a little squirrely. Uh, from 2012 to 2016, it wasn't, it was just a weird period. 
but I know uh, from personal experience that Bob McDonald did reach out. Uh, Shinseki, who was there for a long time, didn't reach out at all to anybody, whether it was the press or whatever. I don't know what he was doing exactly behind the scenes. Uh, McDonald was very active, and he's the one that made his executives reach out to veterans. So, uh, and that was uh, accomplishing quite a bit of good through a former undersecretary, uh, Allison Hickey, who would uh, drive some claims through uh, that were obvious where the VA was screwing up and uh, she would reach out. And so, uh, you know, I think that the change started under Obama and it's been continuing within the VA underneath Shulkin. Uh, they've been set on that trajectory to utilize um, customer service strategies that are similar to like Disney and stuff. And I know that it's kind of a joke, right? Like that we're using systems like Disney, uh, which is pretend, but <laughs> they do apparently have really good customer service and um, the VA didn't. And so now they're, you know, any improvement is better, right? I mean, when you're at zero, uh, a bump up to one is better, right? So yeah. um, so I think they're doing better. They're, um, they are more active with... Um, like client relations, I think they refer to it now, and they're more active in reaching out to stakeholders who could be veterans, although in many instances, they're actually like, you know, uh, people in Amazon or something that have contracts uh, with the VA. But um, but it I, is, I, you know. Well, I was going to say, I just didn't see anything. I didn't see any movement under McDonald. I didn't see anything happening. I didn't, I didn't hear of anything at all. And it mm -hmm. seems like Shulkin, he's been more, uh, I'd say, out in the public eye than than mcdonald was and it looks like you know he's trying to make some improvements it looks like well, he's you know i'll tell you acting, a little about what i think was going on this is just a theory of mine um yeah there were negotiations in place to keep mcdonald on no matter what no matter who won uh in in senate and in in the house um supposedly there was a deal struck to keep somebody on from the administration to move the policies forward um before uh, before the elections happened and really before Donald Trump was known to be the winner. Mm -hmm. So they were, uh, there were policies in place to keep McDonald on regardless of who won. And then McDonald and Trump got into the sparring match, which made it impossible to keep McDonald on. Now, what I think was going on and why uh, the policies that he was working on were not more widely known is because I suspect that they all thought Hillary Clinton was going to win. And they wanted Hillary Clinton to be the big winner for veterans. Oh. And they were going to unroll all this stuff underneath Hillary Clinton after she won. Oh, of course, it's gosh. not what happened. <laughs> and so now it's rolling out under Trump. It would have <laughs> rolled out under either party. You know, so it's kind of like an egg on your face. Oh. We're trying to go after the, the big win, you know. Um, and so now Trump is the winner. But uh, and, and there are things that he's going to do that I think are going to be different and unique. Uh, he's going to be more probably aggressive in some of the outsourcing of, of things that VA does that Hillary wouldn't have done. Hillary probably would have been more friendly to the union. Obviously, oh, we know that Trump is not definitely. Uh, yeah. union friendly in that capacity. And, and personally, like I, I come from a union family. I agree with some of what unions can do. Do I think that the union uh, that is AFGE, the uh, what American Federation of uh, Government Employees, do I think that they have uh are working for veterans no way man they're working for their union constituents so that they can get money and continue to lobby again in a way using taxpayer dollars right because that's who right. funds their employees that funds their dues taxpayers but they're the lobbying arm of of this massive part of the federal government using funds that are essentially paid for by taxpayers to then lobby how the government does business, right? So it's like a government lobby paid for by the government. And uh, as long as they're there doing what they're gonna do, they're gonna be looking out for, uh, you know, number one, which is them, and then some of their national, you know, uh, employees and whatever. And veterans are really gonna get the shaft until that that is dealt with appropriately because VA employees are supposed to be working for veterans and for the American taxpayer. And instead what we have is these union uh, folks that are kind of steering the gaze from the veteran and from what they're supposed to be doing onto AFGE and onto their union folks. And they've created this kind of stakeholder scheme where they control the master agreements and that comes into play when you have like shifts, for example, in um, standards of care and whatnot in hospitals. Some of that you have to run through these stupid master agreement processes. So you can't even change it until the AFG signs off. So uh, there are a lot of hangups that, you know, give AFG a lot of control, even more control than the, than the secretary. And wow, like that's something that needs to be dealt with. But it's still, I 
it's still kind of on the back burner right now. Hopefully, hopefully they bust that union open just like they did with the uh, their air traffic controllers. To be honest. Well, and and I'm going to talk to you about something other than the VA involving veterans, and 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 see what you're thinking about this. You know, there there is obviously a real homeless problem with the veterans. Sure. You know, do you think? I mean, I, I'm watching some groups, specialized groups that I know of, that are trying to do things to help veterans. Uh, veterans on patrol is one of those groups that in, in mm. Arizona that is really trying to, you know, they put up military tents and things of that nature. I noticed that uh, LA and Los Angeles and California is trying to do things now where they have um, housing made out of some type of shipping crates and they put them together and they make apartments. What do we, you know, this, this problem is not going away. And a lot of it is caused, I think, because, you know, veterans aren't getting the proper care that they should be getting in the VA. You know, they're not getting the, the mental health and the, and the physical uh, medical health that they should be getting. You know, what do we do about this huge problem of homeless veterans? Well, uh, the, uh, first of all, I think, you know, looking at scripture, because that's kind of where you lean towards, where people lean towards when they're discussing, you know, what to do with the poor or the homeless. And uh, before Jesus died, he said that the the poor will always be with you. You know, mm -hmm. like the, this is always going to be a thing. And, and um, uh, you know, just you're never going to get away from it. So <clears throat> will there ever be a perfect fix uh, for homelessness ever, whether you're veteran or non-veteran? You know, no, people will always be homeless. Uh, the resources will always be lacking for that. Um, Will the VA ever, ever fully resolve veteran homelessness? You know, it, probably not. Uh, are they, is more money going toward this, you know, in the form of these donations and these donor funded, you know, projects and also projects from VA? Certainly. Um, and, and it's a, it's a, a monolithic ship. I think the only thing we really got to be careful of is to make sure that the funds aren't being either misallocated or, um, skimmed um, for buddies, you know, and for political contributions, which is a big problem in the VA. Right. Uh, but aside from that, you know, the VA is moving in the right direction. Um, there's really no way to to know. I mean, the measures of homelessness to begin with is always uh, difficult, right? Um, and, and not necessarily reliable. They can get close and get kind of an idea. And it sounds like, you know, the homelessness issue was addressed a bit, and it has gone down for veterans. But I don't think it would ever be you know, fully resolved um, uh, ever. Like it's always going to be an issue. Um, but why, funding. but then why not, why not take some of these, like these bases, the military bases that have some, you know, barracks or whatever there uh, and that aren't being used because I mean, I, I think a lot, there are structures on bases. <clears throat> Wouldn't that be right. like the perfect place for some of these homeless veterans to go? I mean, it's back in an environment maybe they were comfortable with and, Care, sure. They felt cared for. Well, you know that's a good question, and I think that you're you're correct. I mean, there are uh, many utilities all across the nation at these bases um, and at other locations that we're not using. Uh, there's no question that that's going on. Um, an industrious person could probably come up with a business model, and and they, the, something does exist in the VA called Veteran Industries, uh, where they take people that are homeless or take people that are. Um, you know, needing work, but in a controlled environment. Uh, and, and they'll try to find employers who will use them. And the employer then is not uh, required to pay workers comp or insurance. The VA ensures their behavior. Uh, and uh, as long as you, you know, apparently contribute back to the VA by donation um, uh, in a similar amount that the wage might be, as I understand it, that's how that program works. So in that environment where you take these veterans who may be homeless, to put them into this like a rehab center where yeah. you teach them certain skills and you just run them through kind of like basic training was really uh, except for civilians. That's again, part of the big problem that we have and part of why we have veteran homelessness. Um, at least one of them uh, in addition to mental health is a lack of skills uh, and adaptability to civilian life. And so the VA um, and DOD could do better to train there are soldiers before they even get out of the military and how to be better civilians and how to more readily take their skill sets and, and get trained into something that's uh, directly applicable to the civilian sector. But the DOD doesn't do that very well. It's an area that they've struggled with. Uh, hopefully it gets better, but 
you know, the transition period has always really sucked. And I think it, the reason why it can be very simple, and you look at uh, statements from um, jerks like uh, Senator John McCain, who uh, is not a friend of veterans and, and who didn't want the new GI Bill funding to go out the way that it did because he thought it might outstrip the military because people would, you know, use their benefits more and get out and seek opportunity as civilians. He didn't like that. Wow. So in, in my opinion, uh, you know, uh, people like him are the reason why the DOD and the VA stuck so bad when it comes to transition and why they, you know, I know that some people are working towards that and improving that, you know, and I don't want to diminish what they're doing, but, um, the funding isn't quite right. And, and, you know, uh, you could look at, for example, I have a brother-in-law who's a, a great doctor, emergency room doctor. Now he was in the Navy for six years after med school and, um, the Navy decided not to have him do a normal residency as part of his tour. They put him in to be a flight surgeon. So after he served his country for six years was deployed, he had to get out after all that experience and, uh, do residency over again. So as, as a man with <laughs> oh children, he had, it's a huge disincentive. And so they offered him a little bit of a enlistment or a, a re-up bonus to keep him in. Uh, or he had to go do a residency again after working in the field for six years. Um, and that's a thing that the Navy does. And I know the other branches do similar that they could do. Uh, they shouldn't do that, but I know that they do that because they want to keep these folks in. And as long as they um, keep, you know, keep the veterans under, under trained or keep the soldiers under trained, you know, in their civilian capacity later, that the problem is going to persist. It could be with anything. There are a thousand different examples of that in the military, all branches where they just don't train the veteran, the soldier quite right. So they could easily flip over to a civilian sector job. They don't yeah. do it. Right. And, and they should, I think that's a under, it's a underserving of the soldier and yeah. later veteran. And, and it would, it would help curb homelessness and all these other problems because they'd be able to get jobs more readily, but you know, they don't want that. People like John McCain don't want that. They want you to be a body bag or, you know, a, a, a life jacket or whatever you call it, a, a bulletproof vest. That's what we used to call some folks, um, you know, to, to, to basically be, you know, cannon fodder for the next right. war. Right. And, and that's what they want. And, uh, while, you know, if, if transitional services get better, it'll make it easier for good soldiers, smart soldiers to get out and take advantage of those programs more than they might have otherwise. And they don't want those guys to leave, those men and women to leave. It's really so they horrible. make it hard. Yep, that's they that's really horrible. We have a, a comment here. It said, regarding your previous comments about the union, I think this is why corrupt employees remain in the VA and are not fired. Also, it is the reason for poor medical care and creates apathy in the care providers. I have on many occasions, I've had providers say to me, they get paid the same whether or not I'm the patient. And she said, that's reassuring. I'm confident that I'm going to get premium health care now. Not, you know, that, I mean, that, uh, I, I've right. I've heard so many things about you know some how the patients are 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 treated in the VA and what and and how they're talked to. I mean, I, again, you know, just the way that a, a veteran going into the VA hospital is is treated like, and I don't want to say the word, but you know what I'm saying. It's inhumane, and I don't yeah. understand it. You know, I mean, you're preaching to the choir, but when you don't have competition. Um, and you're able to just do whatever you want, and the veteran is stuck getting care from you, it creates apathy. It creates a lack of competition. It creates these scenarios where they don't care. They truly don't care. Uh, and again, you know, I keep saying this, there are good VA doctors. There are good VA right. nurses. There are good VA adjudicators. There are also quite a few bad ones. And, uh, and they don't care until they have competition. And until the laws change, that competition is, is just not going to be there. You have a situation now where, as an example, most people don't realize that veterans, unless there is a pre-existing condition uh, clause for getting health insurance, or unless your spouse you know, works at a company that has health insurance or something like that, uh, you can't get health insurance. And so guess where you're stuck going? To you're stuck end. going to these veteran ghettos. And this is the yeah. veteran ghetto is what we have at the VA whether it's, you know, piss poor legal care from, you know, unqualified VSOs that give legal advice who shouldn't, or, uh, you know, some doctors and nurses who, who could care less about the veteran and, and are just there to get a paycheck and try to get you in and out the door. I mean, we're stuck in the veteran ghetto, man. This is where you're stuck. 
I um, we just have a few minutes left, and I, I just got a, a a message from someone saying everyone in Denver was let off the hook at the VA, and and said, "Are you surprised? Do you can you tell us a little bit about that? Do you?" Uh, I'm not. Sh- I mean, there are a lot of things that happen in Denver. So, uh, one thing I, I'm not sure which one thing they're referring to, uh, whether maybe it was the Aurora, you know, hospital scandal where it was originally slated to cost something like 600 million, and then it turned into 1.7 billion dollars. Maybe that was it. Um, or said no DOJ, some- no, uh, no DOJ charges on that. So I don't know if it was mm-hmm. that one or that you're talking. It could be. Um, I'm gonna assume. Yeah, that's probably mm-hmm. it. You know, again, a billion dollars just kind of whoop, you know, where to go. Yeah. Where'd it go? Uh, <laughs> Jeez, right. it's just a small amount of money, right? <laughs> yeah, it kind of reminds me of uh um Dick Cheney and, and Donald Rumsfeld right before nine eleven happened and they they testified before the uh uh Congress regarding, you know, budgeting and we're like, Wow, we don't know where one, two, three trillion trillion dollars just poof. I don't know yeah. where to go. And and then and then magically the Pentagon area that, that had all those records got hit with a magic disappearing plane. Uh not to get into conspiracy theories. But anyway, um <laughs> you know, Chris never come go? true, right? Yeah. It's <laughs> just like, uh, the plane just evaporated. I don't Oops. know. And, but it magically just killed everybody that knew about that yeah. trillion plus, you know, that disappeared and all the records associated with it, but whatever. Whatever. You know, who knows? Things yeah. happen, no. right? Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. You know, you know what? One of the things too, when we were talking about, you know, the medical care and, and the mental health of of, uh, of veterans, I know that recently in Texas they came out with a with a thing where a new law that has been signed into in, in May law and by the governor, I believe, that now veterans have to be offered HBOT. Uh, for PTSD and, and TBI. I don't know if that's, if I'm getting that uh, correctly or not, but I, I, from what I understand that the VA now in Texas has to offer that. So that's hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And that's oh. a new, a new law that's coming into play, which if, if that's true, about that, yeah. yeah, well, mm-hmm. if, if that's true, you know, I've talked to the doctors that, that performed that. And I know that it's not offered in most VA hospitals. And in fact, from what I've understood is that even that the testing to see if somebody has PTSD or TBI isn't being properly done at the VA hospitals, but that, mm. that, you know, you're given all kinds of pills here, take these 50 pills for some people. And that's what, you know, you're just kind of a, a lack of a better word, I think a slug. And then mm. I sometimes I think intentionally that veterans are made uh, to stay that way. But with uh, HBOT, what I'm understanding is that the the outcomes of these people who have TBI and PTSD has been phenomenal, that they're mm. getting great results. And, you know, I'm hoping that I can get people on, uh, Ben, maybe we, uh, next week we can talk to somebody with HBOT. Uh, we can bring them on and we can have a little discussion with them. Because I, I think this is something that needs to go out to veterans. I need to hear more about what's available to them rather mm-hmm. than, than just being thrown pills, you know, to take. Yeah, well, and as I understand it with the, the chambers, they can really help people with uh, traumatic brain injury. Yeah. Uh, and I I heard about this recently, and I, I, I should have written about it, and I just didn't have time at, at the moment, but... Um, I know it was a thing in Oklahoma, and then I thought I heard about yes. it in Ohio. and now In Texas. Arizona. Yeah. Okay. So, so it is, you know, people are looking at this as a solution and good because TBI is expensive. You know, you don't want to have to pay for unmitigated or unresolved or unaccommodated TBI because that costs society, families, and the veteran a ton of money, taxpayers a ton of money. And suicides, the veteran suicides. suicides. Right, Mm -hmm. right. Which coincidentally doesn't cost people a whole lot of money, right? Yeah. Well, interesting that VA's, you know, suicide prevention programs have, you know, consistently uh, lacked great results. You know, right. curious how that how that worked out. Yeah, and the combination of pills that wouldn't add to it. You know what right. I'm saying? Uh, yeah, and I, and I know that in Arizona and Oklahoma, I don't think there are laws passed yet with the VA. They do offer those services, and other places do offer those services. But I, I find out more and more that, that veterans aren't aware of these services, and they don't realize also that you can get, um, you know, there's a lot of things that you don't have to pay for, that those mm-hmm. services are, are you can go in and get HBOT treatments, 
and they're paid for out of like a nonprofit organization. Um, and, and, and I, I have helped in trying to get, uh, donations together for veterans to go and get these treatments. So I know oh. we need a lot more of that, uh, yeah. in our society. And, and, and I'm just telling you that the, the uh, general public is not aware. Uh, of of TBI as much as they should be, they're not aware of what it is. That it's a really a, a huge problem within the VA and with with veterans. Mm-hmm. They don't know about that, and they don't know about HBOD either. You know, so we need to get that awareness out. Uh, you know, to the veteran community and to the general public. They really yeah. need to know about this. No, I agree. So, I agree. So I, I, I know we had a, a lot that we've talked about today and I want to thank everybody, you know, for coming on today and, and Ben, for you being here as a co-host and, and we hope to bring this to you every week on, on Fridays at one o'clock. We want you to get the word out. If you will, please share this with everyone. Uh, we, we want veterans and people who support veterans to come into the show and ask us uh, questions during the show, comment on what we're talking about, because this is for the veterans and for the general public uh, to understand the problems better, you know? So um, it, Ben, any, any last words for today? No, that's it. Just have a okay. great weekend and enjoy some of the summer, summer. Uh, Absolutely. Sun. It's great. So th- again, thank you so much for being here. Please do share and we'll see you again next week. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye.